Hello, chemists. This is Ms. Placino, and you are watching Screencast 13.4 on voltaic cells. In today's lesson, we're going to talk about the different parts of a voltaic cell and really how a voltaic cell works. Um, if you're not familiar with the term voltaic cell, um, you might have heard galvantic cell or more commonly, battery. Um, the voltaic cells that we're going to talk about in today's lesson don't really resemble the batteries that you have in your smartphones and your laptops. These are really rudimentary power sources. Um, they do kind of explain the gist of how your smartphone and laptop batteries work, uh, but these are just much, much simpler versions. Um, today's lesson is also pretty laden with vocabulary. Don't worry, we've got some mnemonic devices to help you out. All right, let's get started. Uh, so here's a picture of just a basic voltaic cell, um, really nothing fancy. We've got two different beakers, we've got two strips of metals, uh, sometimes just more generally called electrodes. We've got this tube connecting the two, and then we've got a wire connecting the metals. Um, sometimes you'll see a voltmeter here. This is just something to measure the amount of energy being produced. Other times you might see like a, a light bulb or something here. Don't be confused by that. It's still the same general setup. In our voltaic cells, we're going to utilize spontaneous redox reactions to produce electrical energy. So we had talked about spontaneous redox, uh, just spontaneous reactions in general earlier this semester. And remember, spontaneous means proceeding in a way that releases energy. So a voltaic cell is going to use these spontaneous reactions to produce energy. And that's the brilliant part of the battery. We've taken chemical energy and we're converting it into electrical energy. All right, let's break down the parts of the voltaic cell. We're going to start off with anode. And at the anode, we have oxidation taking place. You've probably noticed when you look at something like um, a AA battery, for example, that you've got a positive and negative end to the battery. Your anode is the negative terminal on a battery. And the way to remember that oxidation occurs at the anode, what's this? This is an ox. I know, it's pretty bad, but it will help. Anode oxidation. Um, and I remember anode is the negative terminal because I've got N in the word anode, and I of course have N to start the word negative. We've got uh, two different um, electrodes here to choose from. We have copper and we have zinc. And I know I have not gone over the chemical reaction that's taking place, but if you look at the diagram, um, on the copper side, it seems to show electrons being gained, Cu2 plus ions depositing themselves onto the uh, copper electrode. If we look over at the zinc side, it looks like we have two electrons uh, leaving zinc or being lost and Zn2 plus ions being produced. Um, so even if you're not sure which one is oxidation and which is reduction, maybe the pictures will help you out. Zinc is the site, is uh, the anode, and this is where oxidation is taking place. So zinc anode with a negative sign. Here is our half reaction. We start off with solid zinc. We lose two electrons and produce Zn2+, just like this little picture is showing. All right, the other electrode is called the cathode. As you would probably imagine, the cathode is where reduction takes place, and it's the positive terminal on the battery. The letter T is like a little plus sign. Positive is a plus sign. So hopefully that will help you remember that the cathode is positive in a voltaic cell. What's this? This is a red cat. Yeah, pretty good, right? Uh, we've got reduction occurring at the cathode. I know, it's really cheesy, but it will definitely help you out. You'll remember red cat and anox, I promise. So copper is going to be our cathode. We know that's going to be the positive terminal on the battery. And here's our half reaction. We've got copper two ions floating around in solution as the electrons pass through the wire and they end up uh, in the copper cathode, those positively charged copper ions are going to be attracted to the electrons and deposit themselves onto the uh, copper electrode as copper atoms. So if we were to run this voltaic cell for a while, um, we would see that the mass of the anode is going to decrease because zinc atoms are being lost as electrons are lost. And on the other side, our cathode is going to gain mass. The copper ions that are in solution are going to deposit themselves as copper atoms onto that electrode. 
Okay, we have something called a salt bridge, and that is just going to connect the two uh, beakers of ions. So here we have a more realistic looking voltaic cell. We've got our two different beakers. We've got our, in this case, looks like a sheet of metal and a, a nail or something. Anything that's metallic can be used. And this YouTube, old school YouTube, is a salt bridge. Uh, the salt bridge is going to provide a medium for our ions to travel back and forth. There we go. Ions are the only substances that are allowed to get into the salt bridge. So needless to say, this is our salt bridge. You might be wondering, well, why do ions have to travel through the salt bridge anyway? We're going to have to maintain um, a neutral charge in both of our beakers. So as these two electrons are lost and a Zn2 plus is produced in solution, all of a sudden now this has a plus two charge. So in this case, we have our salt, um, well, I should say the anion of our salt, sulfate ion coming through to help neutralize the charge. If we look over at the um, cathode side of our voltaic cell, copper two plus ions are going to be taken out of solution and they're going to end up as copper ions deposited onto the cathode. That means that we're going to have a negative charge build up. So we're gonna to have to have in this case, sulfate ions leaving through the salt bridge. So the salt bridge is really important. If you pull the salt bridge out of the voltaic cell, the cell will no longer produce electricity. Okay, um, electrons are going to flow away from the anode and move closer to the cathode. So now we've got just a regular looking battery. Electrons are leaving the anode. They're going to flow through, in this case it says a motor, this could be a light bulb or a voltmeter, they're going to power something and they're going to move to the cathode. And hopefully this makes sense. We know at the anode oxidation is occurring. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, so they're going to get away from the anode. And reduction is the gain of electrons, so it makes sense that the electrons are going to move towards the cathode. The way we represent this in our voltaic cell diagram is just simply with like an E minus or even just an E and an arrow pointing in the direction of the flow of electrons. Okay, uh, so that kind of sums it up as far as how you label the different parts of a voltaic cell diagram. We're going to take this one step further and talk about how to calculate the voltage that will be produced by a cell. In order to do that, we need to talk a little bit about balancing redox reactions. We've already talked about in the previous lesson that we've got oxidation and reduction half reactions for our redox reactions. The catch is making sure that the electrons that have been lost in oxidation are equal to the electrons that are being gained in reduction. So in our example, we've got the oxidation of zinc and we've got the reduction of copper. Very conveniently, ooh, I forgot my negative charge there. The electrons lost and the electrons gained are equal to one another. So we can really just add them up and cancel them out. Our full balanced redox equation would just be our reactants, in this case Zn and Cu2+, um, then the arrow and our products, Zn2+, and copper. Notice how we're balanced for both mass and charge. I've got one zinc on each side of the equation, same thing with copper. I've got a total charge of 2 plus on the reactants and 2 plus on the products, so I am balanced. We'll show you some problems about what to do when the electrons lost do not equal the electrons gained. In order to calculate the voltage, you need some sort of table, and this information is going to be provided to you. By no means are you expected to memorize it. Um, based on the element that is oxidized and reduced, a certain amount of energy is going to be produced. So if we look in your chart in your notes, it's slightly different from what I've got here, but you want to find zinc and copper because those are what we're working with. Uh, I've got zinc here. I've got copper up here. Now if you know, this is a standard reduction potential table. So you're not gonna find any oxidation half reactions on this table. You're only going to find reduction potentials. Um, so I have the reduction of copper, which is exactly what I have in my half reaction. And then I've got the reduction of zinc, and I've got the opposite of that occurring in this voltaic cell. Sometimes this is called the Daniel cell. So we're gonna write our two half reactions. 
we need to determine the standard reduction potentials. So when copper is reduced, based on the table, um, 0.34 volts of energy is produced. And when zinc is reduced, we end up with it requiring, hence the negative sign, 0.76 volts. Um, we are going to flip this second equation around. Um, we are changing the direction of the reaction. Instead of the reduction, we want the oxidation. If we change the direction of the reaction, what do you think we end up doing with the sign? We need to change that as well. So I'm just going to cross this one out. And as I flip my reaction, I'm going to flip the sign. I'm just going to plug into a very, very simple formula. The total energy or voltage of the cell is equal to the energy produced by the, redu uh, the reduction reaction plus the energy produced by the oxidation reaction. You might be wondering, do I have to show this formula? And the answer is yes. Yes, of course you have to show this formula. Always show your formulas, even if they're very simple. So when I add these up, I end up with 1.10 volts of electricity being produced. When you have a positive voltage, that means that we have a spontaneous reaction and the energy has been produced. There are times you might calculate a negative voltage. That means that you've got a non-spontaneous reaction occurring and the energy is required. Um, and a really good example of negative voltages um, is something like a rechargeable battery. So we'll see when you're using the battery and using it to power something, voltage is going to be positive. It's going to produce electricity and eventually that battery will die and in order to recharge it, you have to plug it in. So you have to force the electrons to go in the opposite direction from which they want to. Therefore, it's going to be a non-spontaneous reaction requiring energy. So if we're going to finish up our voltaic cell diagram, I can include the amount of energy produced by the reduction and oxidation half reactions. And over by the voltmeter, I can include the total voltage of the cell. All right, let's try a practice problem. All right, so I'm back in the workbook and I'm going to take a look at question number one. Let's get back to the red pen. Okay, so in these practice problems, at least this first set of six, uh, you have been given a metal and some ions, actually two metals and their ions. And what we want to do is try to figure out which is going to be the anode, the cathode, write our oxidation and reduction half reactions, write a full balanced redox reaction without any spectator ions, and calculate the voltage. So we have a lot of work here. Um, so we've got sodium and iron. And what you can do is use table J and figure out which one is going to have to be oxidized, which is reduced in order for a spontaneous reaction to occur, or you can use this table. Um, I'm going to use this table that I've got here just because it's already pulled up and ready to go. I want to find sodium and I want to find iron 2 plus. Make sure you're looking at the right iron. Iron can be a 2 plus or 3 plus. So here's sodium right here and iron 2 plus. Oh, very convenient. It's right here. I need to figure out which one is going to be the anode and which is going to be the cathode. Uh, the one that produces the most energy when it's oxidized will be your anode. So both of these are reductions. So the reduction of iron 2 plus requires 0.45 volts of energy and the reduction of the sodium ion requires 2.71 volts of energy or just volts. Uh, so hopefully by looking at this, we can tell, well, if sodium is oxidized, that's going to produce more voltage than if iron 2 plus is oxidized. So sodium must be my anode. And iron, therefore, is my cathode. Remember, the anode and the cathode themselves are the strips of metal. Those metals are in a solution of their own ions. So the oxidation reaction that will take place I'll start off with Na. I know that I'm going to make sodium ions, Na+. Plus, and to balance for charge, I have to include an electron. With the reduction reaction, I start off with my iron th uh, 2 plus, excuse me. I'm going to gain, in this case, two electrons to make iron all by itself. Um, I'll come back to this table. I want to kind of zoom in here and talk about this. 
Okay, in order to come up with a balanced redox reaction, we have to make sure that the number of electrons lost during oxidation is equal to the number of electrons gained during reduction. Very clearly, they are not equal to one another. I lose one electron, I seem to be gaining two electrons. What do you think I can do to balance this out? Hopefully you can see that in order to make the electrons lost by sodium equal to the number of electrons gained by the iron 2 plus atom, or ion, I should say, we need to take this equation and multiply it by 2. If I put a coefficient of 2 in front of the sodium, the sodium ions, and the electrons, then electrons lost will be equal to electrons gained. So I'd write my uh, redox reaction as 2Na plus Fe2 plus will yield 2Na plus plus Fe. Notice again how we're balanced for mass and charge. Two sodium, two sodium. One iron, one iron. A total of plus two on the reactant side, a total of two times plus one, plus two on the product side. All right, almost there. Uh, for voltage, we know the voltage of the cell is equal to the voltage of reduction plus the voltage from oxidation. And honestly, if you just want to write this as E equals R plus O, I'm completely fine with that. Just something communicating that you know where the numbers have come from. Um, let's go back to the chart. So we know that the reduction of iron 2 plus ions is negative 0.45 volts. Let me erase that a little bit. Negative 0.45 volts. I know that the oxidation, or I should say the reduction of sodium is negative 2.71 volts. So if I reverse this for the oxidation of sodium, I end up with positive 2.71 volts. So this is going to be equal to negative 0.45 volts plus 2.71 volts. This is about as complicated as the math is going to get this unit. And you will come up with hopefully 2.26 volts. I know there is not a ton of space there. Actually, if you want to kind of skip out on showing your formula, I'll let that slide because I did not give you a lot of space. All right. Um, why don't you go ahead and try question number four on your own? I will get the answers posted in just a minute. Pause the video, try it out. All right, so if you use either table J or you use the reduction potential table, you'll see that aluminum is going to be the anode and that lead will be the cathode. I've got my oxidation half reaction. Aluminum forms aluminum three plus ions plus three electrons. In reduction, our lead two plus ions gain two electrons to form just the lead atom. Uh, we don't have the same number of electrons being lost and gained. We have to take, uh, let's do it another color. You've got to take lead and multiply it by three, the aluminum, and multiply everything by two. Once you do that, you'll have an, uh, six electrons lost and six electrons gained, so they'll cancel out. Then you end up with a full balanced redox of two aluminums plus three lead, two plus ions yields two aluminum, three plus ions plus three leads. We're balanced for mass, we're balanced for charge. One thing to note, and I should have mentioned it in the previous uh, problem, even if you have to multiply an equation, put it over here with sodium, you do not change the voltage produced by that half reaction. You can think about voltage being more of an intrinsic property and not an extrinsic property. Therefore, it's not really dependent upon quantity. Um, it's just more intrinsic of the material itself. So do not take your um, coefficients and try to multiply your voltage by them, that's going to lead you down the wrong path every single time. Uh, never ever change the voltages that are provided um, in the standard reduction table, unless of course you're flipping it to an oxidation. You're allowed to change the sign, you are not allowed to change the numerical value. All right, I know there was a lot to take in that lesson, keep on practicing. Um, I hope you found this helpful and thanks for tuning in.